So welcome back to another episode on the IMG series. Today I have Dr. Javon Temperon joining us today and I'm really excited because I had originally connected with Javon on a Facebook group that is dedicated to um, Filipino doctors who are wanting to pursue the USMLE. So I'm really excited to have a fellow Filipino on here. <laughs> welcome Javon. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. This is such a good idea. I, I wish that there had been more videos out like this when I was when I was applying. Hopefully it's helpful. Absolutely. So just a little kind of background about Javon. Um, you were born in Texas and then you um, grew up in California. And then so Javon also moved to the Philippines to do um, her pre-med and to go to medical school. Then you graduated from UST um, in 2015. And then you did your year of internship, which uh, in the Philippines kind of is not the same as the first year of, of residency here in the US. It translate as, translates as kind of like your fifth year of medical school or like postgraduate training. And then you applied to match um, match of 2022 oh sorry 2020 yes, right 2020. um so i had quite a bit of a gap in there which i can explain later so yeah that's basically it um yeah. and then i uh, i'm currently matched at saint agnes medical center um in their family medicine program in fresno california which is where i'm from and i grew up um and i'm currently an intern. I'll be a uh, second year um, in June, July. And um, I recently just got um, voted as a chief of my class. So acting chief and assisting chief to our residency program chiefs. That's um, amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. So um, a couple of questions that I usually like to ask my guests, um, depending on um, who my guests are, of course. Why, in your situation, why did you decide to pursue your pre-med and medical school in the Philippines? Yeah, sure. So um, pursuing pre, uh, pre-med in the Philippines was kind of just like a really spontaneous decision. Um, I had been visiting for vacation and I, my family kind of just suggested, you know, like, why don't you try going to school here? It would save you a lot of money, a lot of family and um, in the area. So it wouldn't be that big of an adjustment. And I figured it would be a really uh, cool way of kind of immersing myself in my family's culture. Um, so I decided to start going to school there. And then eventually that led to medical school, obviously, which I had intended to do in the Philippines anyways, um, just because of financial region, reasons. Um, it would save me and my family a lot of money. And um, I had known people who'd done it previously and it worked out really well for them and they were able to match into programs here in the, in the United States. So I ended up doing that. Um, yeah, it was kind of a spur of the moment decision for pre-med, but um, it actually ended up working out really well because I finished my pre-med in the same school that I went to medical school in, which was UST. Um, and so having um, the experience there, you know, it was a little bit easier for me to get into the program um, being a graduate of that school. So it worked out. <laughs> Yeah, that's something I noticed about um, Filipinos that are born and raised here in the U.S. and they go to the Philippines to do either pre-med like you and um, and or medical school. I mean, tuition fee is no joke when you go to medical school. You're getting quality education in the Philippines, plus it's a lot cheaper. Um, and so like based on your experience, since you were able to kind of get a taste of what it's like to study and train in the Philippines and here in the US, how would you compare? Um, how would you say they were different? I would say that um, our medical training in the Philippines is different because it's so hands-on. I don't think we appreciate when you're in the midst of training there, how much, um, <laughs> basically how much autonomy and freedom you get and how much hands-on experience you have with your patients. I've done things during medical school that none of my colleagues have been able to do, um, like 
probably done like 20 at least circumcisions during all the missions we do in school. And I don't really know anybody who's been able to do that except for one of my co-residents who was a urologist back in his home country. <laughs> um, stuff like that and just, I guess the exposure to the kind of rural healthcare that we had to practice when we were there. Right. I mean, unless you trained in a really rural area here in the States, you wouldn't get that kind of exposure. Um, so it's very hands-on and I would encourage like people who are applying to really take advantage of that experience because those are things that you can um, kind of wear on your belt when you yes. apply. Um, and uh, other than that, it really was really good quality education, at least for, you know, I can speak for UST. Um, I applied when I had, you know, after a really significant gap between medical school and the match. And I still have been told that I'm faring really well in terms of my performance in residency. And that's with, that's not even being fresh out of medical school. So oh, yeah. uh, it's really something not to be overlooked. I think the experience we get there is really, really valuable and unique. Um, I mean, people who study in third world countries will have a similar experience, but I, I only learned to appreciate it now, to be honest. I, I, we delivered babies in Fabella like it was nothing. And yes, I have colleagues who have never, who've never delivered a baby on their own before. My very first delivery was by myself. <laughs> So you kind of just had to, it was like sink or swim, right? Right. But I think by being in those situations, you gain really, really sharp instincts um, when you when you start residency here. I think it's really good preparation in general. Absolutely. And I can attest to that as well, because I did all my medical education in the Philippines as well, um, did my internship there, and I had my OB rotation in Quirino. Um, another public hospital that's kind of on almost on the same level as Fabelia. Um, and I remember when I was an intern, rather a clerk, so I was a JI there, and we would go 24 hours most of the time without sitting down, sometimes not even eating, because you're constantly like delivering, you know, doing all yeah. these deliveries. <laughs> C CS and uh, normal delivery, and then you're having to do, you know, um, Cure uh, di dilation and cure touch, and it's yeah. like constant. And yeah. you got to do um, sometimes you even do um, uh, what do you call you draw blood, you clean up after the mom. It's just constant. You, you do did, like you did the job of a nurse here, right? the, basically, <laughs> which I find is also really helpful with interacting with nurses here because I think you understand more of what they do and you're able to be considerate of of like ordering things because you want, you remember, <laughs> you remember the hassle of having to do things last minute and just not having orders um, put in all at the same time, you know? Um, it's a tough job. So it, is, it is, it really makes you appreciate what they do, but it also makes you glad you don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> oh my gosh. When you come here. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if, if there was something that you could kind of uh, change and you could kind of go back in time. What are some of the things that you would have done differently? Yeah, so that was my favorite question because there are a lot of things <laughs> I would have done differently. First of all, I would have planned ahead. I planned a little bit earlier. Um, I wasn't as proactive about um, you know, my journey for the steps and application. I was very focused on what was going on in med school at the time. Just, mm -hmm. it's easy to get overwhelmed with that alone. So it's hard to kind of plan ahead and be mindful of how is what I'm doing now gonna affect, you know, the, my process later on and applying for the steps. How will this give me an edge? Planning out your electives ahead of time. I would have done that um, a lot better. Um, and uh, cause I didn't do any electives during medical school, um, I decided to stay and do the uh, four weeks of neurology and psych, or I think it was psych because that was required at the time when you had to apply to California. You had to have a, have a certain number of psych hours. And so I dedicated my electives to that. Um, 
now apparently, well, you don't need that anymore because uh, they are not requiring the PTEL anymore. So had I known that obviously I wouldn't have done that and I would have done an elective here in the States, you know, mm-hmm. to because networking and, and making those connections is everything. Um, another, another thing I would have changed is I would have, and I mean, it goes hand in hand with planning ahead is I would have proceeded with all my steps more um, kind of right after graduation. Um, I do appreciate my year of internship. I think what I would have done differently was I probably could have taken my steps during internship or at least prepared for them during internship. Um, depending where you do your internship, that may or may not be feasible. Right. Um, I did it in Makati Medical Center. Yes. And we had a fairly um, doable schedule. I feel like I could have made time for that. And that would have saved me a lot, you know, at least six months to a year um, in, in doing all my steps. And I, I could have been ready for match right out the gate had I prepared ahead of time. Um, because something that I think a lot of people kind of look past is that they really do take into consideration during application how long it's been since you've graduated. Right. Um, And I guess you can make up for that time by doing observerships and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, observerships don't hold the same weight as hands-on clinical experience in the U.S., like electives. Um, So I definitely would have not waited as long. (laughs) Right. Um, There were certain circumstances I couldn't couldn't really change, which uh, made me take the break that I did. Um, I had some time off. I had a family member who became terminally ill and I was the only one in my family unemployed and able to take care of him. So I took a year off to take care of him. Um, I was studying for my step one at the time, which was very, very difficult. It really is. Yeah, being a caregiver 24 seven then trying to make time to study was difficult, but by God's grace, I passed. I didn't get the best score, but I passed. So, you know, life happens, but to, when you have time to just try to try your best and squeeze them in, cause you never know what's going to happen down the road. And then you get pushed even further. Um, so yeah, I think those were the two main things that I would have changed. Yeah. Speaking of, um, preparing for steps, um, particularly step one, what were some of the resources that you had used to prepare for that? So, um, mainly my resource for step one was UWorld the question banks and first aid. I, in the beginning, I had used the Kaplan videos only to reinstill certain topics that I felt I wasn't, you know, uh, strong in. Right. And I did read some of the, um, I believe it was like Pathoma or, mm-hmm. or something like yes. that for pathology, but I didn't really dwell on that too much. I, um, focused mainly on New World and First Aid, kind of just because of my situation at the time. Um, and then I think I probably studied for a total of a year, but it was very like on and off and very sporadic because of everything that was going on. Um, so I, I know that there are more things like um, the flashcards, like Inky, I think it's Yes, yeah. and Sketchy so- and all those stuff. There's so much more of that now. When I started, it was like only Anki I would heard of. And I actually did subscribe to that and tried it. But I, I, I'm, it depends on your personality. Yes. I'm more of like a, you know, focus on one thing and then like kill Kind that. of master it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I personally would have done with just the U world and then first aid and then just doing that religiously. I think sometimes you get overwhelmed with too many resources and it's, you need to study. me. <laughs> yeah, study smart is what I always tell people. Um, don't, it's not about how much you know necessarily, because if you're studying all these things and you don't retain them at the end of the day, it's, it's not going to help. So, you know, do the question bank, get familiar with what is asked a lot and which topics are really common and then master those. And then, you know, after that, it's just, you know, study what what you can and don't overwhelm yourself with too many resources. Yeah, Yeah, I think 
that's more of like some of the questions that surround how to prepare step one as an IMG, because you're not familiar at all with the curriculum that Americans or AMGs are used to and also the approach to questions. So, you know, coming from the Philippines, um, just like yourself, it's, it's, it's overwhelming to have all these resources kind of laid out in front of you and you kind of think to yourself, oh my gosh, well, how do I start? What's the best resource? Am I even using the correct one? Is this actually going to help me in the long run? And um, I am I'm struggling with step one, to be honest, like I'm currently preparing for it. But there are always these kind of new resources that come up and claim that they're they're going to help you score better in step one. But then at the same time, I think to myself, I think like you had just said, if you focus on the core resources and make the most out of it, then that becomes more of a, a way to study smart, like you had just said. Yeah, and when it comes down to it, I would would say, I mean, it, it, like I said, it's not the same for everyone, but I would feel like it's more effective getting to do at least two rounds of UWorld and at least like, I don't know, go through first aid multiple times than right. do all of these resources only once. Um, I think repetition is key because there's yes. so much information. That's really the only way you're gonna you're gonna absorb anything. And I I'm I'm one who has to like read a paragraph like three times just to absorb it. I'm the same. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I would just focus on a couple to a few resources. Um, don't get distracted by all these other. And I see that all the time too. Like on Instagram, everyone's doing these reels about oh how I prepare. Yes. This. And I'm like. Oh my gosh, had these things been around when I was studying, I would have been so overwhelmed as well. Oh so, my gosh, you know, yes. do your thing. You know what works best for you. Stick with that. I think that's how you're going to get the best results. To be honest. Yeah, definitely. I, that gives me, that puts me at ease. It gives me comfort just knowing from somebody who had taken step one and already passed it and kind of gotten over that, um, that big hump. Because it's tough to study for. But yeah, definitely. Um, not overwhelming yourself too much with all these resources is I, I I agree with you on that one yeah um and um I guess like moving on to the the whole residency process what are some of the tools if 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 ever you did use any um that you use during the match process because I know there are so many websites out there and apps such as like match a resident all these other overwhelming resources once more um is there something yeah. that like helped you yeah, so I um I kind of bit into the whole match a resident thing. Oh, you <laughs> did. I was I was so overwhelmed. Like, how do you even narrow down, mm -hmm. you know, the programs to apply to? Like, I mean, who has the time to go through each website for each resident? Right. And like narrow it down um, with regards to requirements and stuff like that. Um, so I did that just to kind of help narrow down because it, it kind of takes into consideration your score, whether or not you have a visa, if you're an IMG or not, um, and then obviously by specialty, whatever you prefer, location, um, that kind of just helped. And then from that, I was able to narrow down and then it made it a little more doable to go to each website and kind of just sift and, and see, you know, if I was feeling it or not. And I, I, I would go and see if like, oh, I wonder if there's anybody from my school in this program, because mm -hmm. that kind of gives you an idea if something's practical or not, because right. honestly, application is really expensive um, and not everyone can afford to just mass apply. Um, and I know a lot of people who did, but not everybody can do that. So it, I think it's really important to apply smart as well. And um, yeah, I would start doing that earlier on too, because I also waited maybe like <laughs> a month before to start doing that. And it was very um, overwhelming. I had a lot of sleepless nights, like the night before, the day before I um, submitted my application, I was up all night, last minute, like adding programs last minute. Right. And, um, so, so yeah, that was basically the only app or like website that I used and you have to pay for that, unfortunately. But if, you know, money is an issue, then I would just plan ahead. Like I said, um, do your research ahead of time mm -hmm. and 
obviously, you know, if you know there's a place that you want to match to, if you have family in a certain area and you really want to um, go there, then that makes it easier. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's nice to hear that feedback because um, I'm seeing a lot of, I guess, like, I know the match a resident has a brand ambassador program. And so it's easy to kind of get hooked onto um, their feedback about it. Obviously everything's really positive, but it's, it's, it's important to see that you need to be practical if you can do mm -hmm. things manually or on your own and just like ahead of time. And yeah. I'll say, cause this whole process is super expensive. So any chance you get <laughs> to save. Um, and so, how did you decide, I mean, like kind of to piggyback on that, how did you decide um, which programs you were going to rank on your list? So um, I applied to two, well, three specialties. I knew that I wanted to do primary care. So um, at the time I was in love with peds. I thought that's what I was gonna do for the rest of my life. So I applied to peds as kind of my primary uh, choice and then family medicine. Um, I also enjoyed because it's primary care based and you get to see kids too. Yes. Um, so I would have been happy to do that as well. And then as a backup, I had applied to internal medicine, but I admittedly, I hate, I am. I, <laughs> I, I don't like the hospital, like hospitalist stuff or ICU and stuff like that. So I know mm -hmm. that's not something I wanted to do, but it was a backup. So for Pete's, because I wanted Pete so much, I kind of was less picky about where and what kind of program. Like I sort of just, I would say mass applied to like Pete's programs everywhere. And then um, for family medicine, I was like, I love family medicine, but not as much as Pete's. So if I'm going to do family medicine, it's going to be in an area that I'd really like to live in. Right. Um, Cause you know, you're kind of making that compromise. And so I applied to programs that like in Hawaii, everywhere in California, cause that was my goal was to stay home or mm. near my family and my fiance. So um, California, like Hawaii, Nashville, like places like I'd be like, okay, I'll give up Pete's for this. Right. Um, and then for I am, it was like literally only the places I would give up Pete's and family medicine to live. So it was like Hawaii and California only. Um, so that's kind of how I decided. And then, but when it, you know, all throughout the interview process itself, I actually started, I, I truly had this calling for family medicine. Like I, I kind of realized more and more after interviewing with, with certain family medicine programs, I was like, you know, this is kind of, it, it, it was like tugging at my heartstrings. I don't know. I can't even put my finger on it. I just had this feeling like that was supposed to be something I was going to do. And yeah, at the time, I was also volunteering in my free time at a hospice home. So I had a lot of geriatric patients and that was kind of like straying away from my comfort zone with peds. Mm. I, I'd always kind of centered my rotations around peds and my observerships. And so I never really gave um, family medicine a chance when I look back at my rotations and my observerships. So when I started doing um, that volunteer work with geriatrics and I did a free clinic, which was all adults here in Fresno, I kind of realized like, I kind of really <laughs> like this. And I was kind of doing that alongside interview application. I hadn't done it previous, like prior to taking my steps or anything. It was all very recent. So all of that kind of wow. was like, Oh, I feel like God's telling me I, I'm, I might be for family medicine. And then I went through all my interviews. I had a total of um, uh, 13 interviews. And um, I, I don't know, I kind of just went with my gut, like last, literally last minute when I was submitting my rank list, like, I think, I think I'm going to rank family medicine. So I, I decided like my first choice was a PEDS program here in Fresno. And then my second choice were all the family medicine programs in California. And then I ended up matching with my second choice, with, which was St. Agnes. And I, like this sounds so cliche, but I literally, it all makes sense now um, why, why I got matched here. Um, and it ended up being a really perfect fit. I actually kind of grew up in this hospital. <laughs> wow. My mom works and she's worked here for like 20 years. 
Um, so it was kind of very full circle and kind of ironic that I ended up back there. And but it and it worked out so well because um, I really enjoy it. Like everyone I work with, like is amazing. Our attendings are awesome. It's just a very very healthy um, environment to work in. And I mean, you thrive in those kinds of environments. Right. And really attribute like you know my um, success, I would say, and yes. my performing well because of that. Like it's it's that kind of environment. So it worked out. I it honestly changes your priorities change along the way i don't know if that's going to happen for everyone but that's kind of how it happened for me and how i chose the programs that i chose but it depends on you if your priority is location then obviously you know if you're willing to give up whatever your specialty may be to live near your family or you know live in a, in a place you already are settled in then that's fine. I know a lot of people who who did that, but if you're really sold on a certain specialty, then you have to rank that way. Right. Depends. Yeah, that's how it worked out for me. Yeah, I've, I've heard so many stories about people kind of sharing how they decided on a specific program or institution, and they always say the same thing, to, is to kind of like go with your gut. You just never know, and um, <laughs> I'm glad it all worked out, and things everything kind of fell into place. Yeah. You seem very like happy in the fact that your mom, um, she currently works there. Is that what? Or yeah, I literally got signed <laughs> up for her from her like a couple of weeks ago because I was working in the ICU and she works in the CVIC. <laughs> so I went down there in the mornings, in the morning and she works at night. So she's kind of signing out um, her patients in the morning. So that is awesome. Care of my patients at night. It's really funny. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. You guys get to kind of <laughs> work as a team I love that yeah, and I live at home so we see each other at work we see each other at home but you know I love my mom <laughs> and it's awesome living with her I'm yes. not in a rush to leave oh <laughs> yeah a lot of money too which is why one of the reasons I wanted to stay home that's that's very practical and I feel like people tend to forget that it's okay to live at home with your family if that means like yeah getting to spend more time with them and saving money so that's like win-win situation um i had somebody um one of my followers ask me um or she her question was imgs often encounter preconceptions that the reason they went abroad for medical education was because they weren't good enough so they're seen as less than or inferior to u.s students did you have any experience um, similar to that during interviews or in general? And if so, how did you deal with it? The only experience I had with that personally was with myself. <laughs> All throughout application process, I was always getting in my own way, I feel like. And mm. there's a lot of insecurity and self-doubt um, because of that preconception. Yeah. But I didn't feel any of that during the interview process um, from programs like uh, most of the programs that I applied to were mostly IMGs. So I oh, didn't wow. really feel that at all. And even in the programs that I interviewed in that were more of the AMGs, they it wasn't really anything that was brought up. If anything, I purposely kind of honed in on my training um, abroad because I felt, like I said, like what you're insecure about, you're going to like be really defensive about. Yes. Right. So I, I kind of like focused my personal statement on the fact that, or on, yeah, on the fact that I think my training in the Philippines is actually gives me an edge. So I focused on that, like these were my experiences and I don't think anybody here has those experiences. Like I didn't say that, but <laughs> how, how it, you know, working in that kind of environment really sharpens your clinical eye and it makes you resourceful. You know, it makes you that's, think harder. That's like the key word right there. As um, yeah. Like, I feel like um, you're so right in saying that the, the person that we kind of have to battle most often is ourselves because coming to the US, especially as somebody who um, was raised in like a different country other than the US, you always feel kind of smaller than everybody here. And so yeah. you, there's a lot of self doubt. And I love that you highlighted your experience in the Philippines and that, you know, we are a third world country, but we do have amazing training and we get 
really quality education. I love that you put that in the personal statement. It That's was awesome. like, I really focused on that because I, I really do believe it though. Like yes. I, I believed it then, but now that I'm in residency, I really see how, how it's helped me. And to be honest, like, I find that like our program is pretty much all IMGs because even the U.S. citizens who are in my program, they study in the, in the Caribbean. So it's okay. technically an IMG as well. Right. There's, we're so hardworking and um, you really won't realize that until you start working aside, uh, side by side with other residents from here and anywhere else. Um, we, we're used to doing really, really hard work. Um, and I'm not saying that makes residency easy, but it makes it a lot more tolerable because I feel personally like I've been through the worst of it. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. So the makes, training you get back home is just. It makes you appreciate uh, what the training is like here. Yes. Um, like there's no such thing as like resident wellness or, you know. Like, oh, absolutely no not. Program. Yeah. There's no, there's no like, um, there's no, they don't. I never heard of mental, like providing mental health resources. And no. They're very mindful of that here. Yes. And it's, it's awesome. Um, um, so yeah, I really focused on that, on my personal statement. I opened my personal statement with a case um, that, you know, not everyone sees here. Um, and it was like of a baby who had omphalitis from getting his um, umbilical cord cut with like, an axe like out in like the you know by what do you what do you call the um the provinces or something oh like okay that. yes 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 <laughs> and I opened with that just because like that was the most experience like memorable experience to me is taking care of something like that and people who had no access to medical care and that kind of just grabbed their attention from the yes. beginning and I would say like most of the interviews I went to asked me questions about my personal statement because they were so interested in my experience so this is nothing to be insecure about. I think it's time for people to get over that insecurity because I, I see people every day proving that, you know, it's, it's an advantage and, it yes. gets and people are doing really well um, in residency programs um, from the Philippines. Uh, my friends also have the same experience and, and they're thriving as well. So I think that's, um, in your own head and if someone else is telling you that then it's time to prove them wrong <laughs> yeah um i <laughs> i that's such an important message because i think as imgs we tend to forget all the unique experiences that we've had in our home countries that aren't some like you said you had a case of omphalitis and it's not something where nobody here in the u.s would ever have a case where um, an umbilical cord would be cut with an axe so that's all these unique cases and all the exposure that we get as imgs and um all the unique qualities that we bring from our training in let's say the philippines or elsewhere are some of the things that we can definitely kind of like put the spotlight on and say, hey, this is what I learned. This is how I grew as a physician because of my training there, this and that. It's total opposite of, oh, I can't speak English properly. I can't really like, you know, I don't really know all the all the, the medications here in the US. It's kind of like debilitating. All these things we tend to forget um, and just focus on the negative. So I love that you're talking more about shining a more positive light yeah. on what we've learned in our like home countries or wherever you do your medical education outside of the U.S. That's, oh, yeah. I That's love that. Definitely underrated. And unfortunately, the people who, you know, tend to forget that the most are the applicants themselves. Like, yes, the it's like, absolutely. Don't get caught up in, in the insecurity or don't, or, you know, intimidation when thinking about applying against other American graduates. Yes. Um, I think it really comes down to your resume and honestly how you shine during interview. Yes. And all that other stuff is learned, like, you know, learning the US health system. Anybody can learn that. And, you know, that's where observerships and obviously electives come into play. But 
all that stuff is learned, but your experience um, and your hands-on training in the Philippines, that's really something unique and, you know, you don't just pick up anywhere. Yes, so. definitely. Would you say um, that there were any questions during your residency interviews that were directed to you being an IMG, other than you mentioning that, you know, they asked you about your personal statement and things like that? Yeah, um, I think most of the ones I can recall were kind of just based on my personal statement, but they were, you know, they would ask things like, oh, so I see you had a really um, interesting training in the Philippines. How do you think this is, will be an advantage to you or advantage to you in residency? Or how do you think um, this made you a better, you know, uh, physician or how it will make you a better physician? What things will you carry with you into residency? Um, those were a lot of the questions that uh, were related to that. And like I said, I, I kind of just went back to how hardworking it's, it's made you and how appreciative it makes you of, of you know, working environment here and the resources. Um, like I said, it makes you resourceful and, and uh, you carry with you a sharper clinical eye. Uh, you carry with you a um, consideration for a patient's socioeconomic status, religion. Absolutely. Um, you know, just things like that that you probably wouldn't really think about twice if you had never experienced having to figure yes. out how you're going to diagnose a patient yes. who can't afford lab. <laughs> um, so I think those are things to, to, um, to flaunt. To be honest, um, I like that word. Yeah, of, um, it's not it's not a disadvantage at all. No. Absolutely, I agree with everything you have just said. And um, lastly, what advice would you have apart from everything that you just shared? What advice would you have for other IMGs or medical students who want to go down the same path as you? Life in general. Um, like I said, again, I know I sound really redundant, but plan ahead. Um, it's really hard and overwhelming to do things last minute. Uh, talk to other people who have done, have gone through the same thing. Um, because I didn't really do that that much. I mean, I knew a couple people, but uh, I didn't reach out as much as I probably could have. Um, so I think it's great that you're you're doing this and that this will hopefully will be really helpful for people. Um, and also, um, um, like I said, get over your insecurities yes. and see the positive of what your training has provided you. Hone in on your strengths and don't focus on your weaknesses. If if language is something that you're insecure about, then take time to practice, um, speak in English even when you don't yes. feel comfortable. That's yes. literally the only way you're gonna learn. Um, I've helped people who get ready for interviews who were very insecure about their ability to speak English. Um, but I would tell them, you know, when you're talking to me um, out of the context of interviewing and when we're just having conversation, you speak fine. And then the second that you practice answering a question that's when you start to freak out so really it just you really just need to be yourself don't yes. overthink don't overthink um that's literally your enemy is overthinking um it will just make you even more nervous um and let's see um really shine during the interview because I, this is my first year being on the other side and actually interviewing applicants. Um, and there have been applicants who, oh, you know, they, they've done okay on their resume and then have kind of just sank during the interview, act interested, but obviously you don't want to look too overly eager, but, right. you know, take that as an opportunity to show your personality. We already know what's on your resume. We already know your scores. Um, but we want to figure out if we want to actually work with you <laughs> or not. Like, that's the reason why the, the residents do interviews too. That's the reason why um, sometimes they'll ask you funny questions or things that aren't even medically related because they want to see um, what you're like to work with and to yes. interact with. 
um, when we did our interviews, we would ask a bunch of funny questions just to like break the ice, but also <laughs> to, like, this is like, see, cause it, it really does catch you off guard. And that's when you really see somebody's personality shine through. So I had a lot of fun doing interviews and then, yeah. Um, don't take too much time preparing. It's so easy to procrastinate mm-hmm. when you feel, you, you feel like, Oh, I'm not ready. And I'll take, I'll postpone yes. for another month. I kept doing that. And me, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's okay. Take out the whole, the, the, if you really are not doing well in your practice tests and whatnot, then do that as needed. But um, I, I also know people who ended up pushing it so much that it just never happened. Um, obviously if this is something you truly want to do, I know that's not, you know, gonna, gonna happen, but, um, really f- dedicate focus study time. Um, I didn't have that luxury for my step one. And I think that would have made a huge difference. Um, um, focus on electives if you're able to mm-hmm. do electives in the U S I know it's also expensive, which is one of the reasons why I didn't do it. But if you're not able to do those, do U.S. observerships. It's better than nothing. I know they say it's not U.S. hands-on clinical experience, but there are a lot of um, programs, um, especially those with Filipino alumni that offer observerships. Honestly, reach out. Just don't be shy. I literally just had no pride anymore. I literally was just sending mass emails out to people asking if they would accommodate me. People I'd never met before. I was on web like website like university websites trying to track down email any email i could for any attending that i could find and i would just send them personal emails lots of times you don't get an answer lots of times you get a no but i got a few yeses from people who ended up helping me significantly in this um journey one of them got me an interview to a program I never thought in a million years I get an interview to. Um, so it's really all about connections and making that effort to just, you know, do what you can do. Don't just, you know, you need to be proactive, honestly, in, in, in um, application. And if you really want to make your resume shine, you have to be proactive. Yes. Um, um, you don't just wait for those opportunities to come around because they're not always going to do that and you're just going to waste time. Um, so plan ahead in between exams. If you have time to do an observership in another state, do that. Um, if you have to study while you do that, that's fine too. Um, and, you know, because then you'll get really good letters of recommendation as well. Right. Which is also really important. Um, let's see what else. I feel like I'm like getting really disorganized. <laughs> No, because sometimes you just need like one yes out of all the emails you were talking about, email sending them out. You just need one yes. And I think people kind of hesitate a little bit to send out these emails because they're going to be like, I'm going to feel bad if somebody says no to me or doesn't even reply. But go into it expecting that you probably won't even get a reply from 50 um, hospitals or institutions. But if you get at least one person that says yes to you, that's just all you need sometimes. And I mean, I, I really like was, I, I was kind of desperate at the time, to be honest. I was emailing programs that I'm like, I'm never going to, I'm never going to get an observership at UCSF Fresno. Um, They have a campus here in Fresno. And I just sent a random email out to one of the attendings who um, worked there. And I didn't hear from anybody for months, but she she replied and she ended up being the most instrumental person in my application process i mean i didn't get into the program but now i know that it was all god's plan for me but it was just amazing the people you meet yes you take the chance to reach out you never you truly never know i love that yeah You, you you shared so many pearls of wisdom today javon and i'm I'm pretty sure everybody who gets a chance to watch this will take away so much and learn so much from your interview. Um, so I really, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. And um, 
that about wraps up today's episode on the IMG series. And um, I'll see you guys in the next episode.